Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. My name is Jamie Pease. Most of you know me. I'm the chair of the security working group for here at uh, GSE UK. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Brian Childs um, from IBM. And uh, it's an early, well, reasonably early start for him. He's uh, in uh, Poughkeepsie, um, live from Poughkeepsie. And uh, so eight o'clock in the morning for him there. I think, Brian, this is your first time to, uh, to, to GSE, isn't it, UK? So oh, a very warm welcome. Um, just for logistics, so this is session 1A0 for the purpose of feedback. And just a quick recap on that for any sessions that you attended you know, prior to this, um, and certainly for Brian's session and other sessions that you'll attend, to get to get to feedback, all you need to do is click on the agenda and um, click on the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the the meeting that you want to give feedback on and scroll right to the bottom and you'll see the feedback link there. Um, if you've got any questions, by the way, throughout Brian's session, uh, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I, we can also unmute your lines, just raise your hand, use the reactions button and uh, you can um, and it will happily unmute your line. So uh, welcome, Brian. I'm really looking forward to this. It's um, we were talking about kind of vulnerabilities in code yesterday. We had a session on that from um, from a very young guy called Jake Labelle. Um, so this is going to be really interesting, I think, for our viewers to hear what you have to say. So without further ado, over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Jamie, and uh, thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Brian Childs. I'm the product manager for Zero Security, and today the focus of this presentation is the IBM ZOS Authorized Code Scanner. Uh, so as uh, we start up here, session 1AO, uh, here is uh, information again on the GSC UK Conference 2021 charity raffle. Uh, so I encourage everybody's participation there. Uh, if you are so inclined, uh, we'll put in the boilerplate notices and disclaimers as an as a IBM speaker here, we'll just flash through that. And, and we can do essentially the, the, the first uh, slide on the topic. So uh, whenever I talk about any kind of security function on ZOS, I will start with a statement similar to this, uh, that use cases for cybersecurity are called risks. And the reason I say that is everybody needs to have some kind of justification on their time, uh, let alone their investment as to anything that they're going to do, right? There's there's always the, the crunch and the, the, the business decision on where you're going to move next. And so when we talk about cybersecurity in any kind of mitigation that you're going to do, well, then you want to take a, a look at the, the associated business risk involved and your investment to, to mitigate that. So here at the bottom is the link at IBM.com security data breach on the latest stats. Uh, in 2021, uh, they are going up. Uh, just a, a couple different things here of note. The average cost of a data breach is uh, 4.24 million US dollars. And the average time to identify and contain a breach is, uh, is up to 287 days uh, as the average. Uh, so those, those are some, some concern, certainly. And I think it, it sparks people's interest to uh, take a little bit uh, closer look at their overall security posture. Um, but I'll, I'll confess, and I've done this myself a number of different times, uh, talking about pervasive encryption, talking about any number of uh, security functions uh, to mitigate risk. This may be a, a very undesirable outcome, but a data breach in itself is not an attack vector. When you are trying to decide when you want to invest in your security posture, then you want to try and make an assessment within your own enterprise where is your current greatest risk? You're not going to understand that or come to a conclusion from something like this. This, this is saying, well, there, there is risk, but you want to be able to make a, an informed decision with the configuration that you know you have today, say, where, where is your greater risk and what do you need to mitigate next if you're going to increase that posture? Uh, so, so somewhat whimsically, if uh, on, on, a, on a lighter note, if we were going to create a custom card game on your security posture on ZOS, and yes, we did design a card game, like a working card game. Uh, so how might we create that? One of the suits that you would want to have in this custom card game is risk. 
because if you're going to be increasing your security posture, you want to be able to, to identify what risk you are going to be mitigating. So here we, we note that these are platform independent risks. This is not specific to Z in any fashion. These would apply to anything in the IT industry. So a lot of these terms you've heard before, there's the risk of privilege creep that over time, uh, any individual in your organization uh, moving roles gets increased access to more resources and it increases risk to your organization because well, what if their credentials were compromised, uh, let alone the insider threat type of, of risk associated? And, and that really comes back to the, the tenant of, or at least the fundamental principle, you wanna always have least access privilege to your security controls. As another example, uh, user ID enumeration. You wanna look at your configuration of your security database and say, am I making sure at log on and, and how these things are set up that I'm not disclosing inadvertently you know, a long list of user IDs that someone could use in some kind of brute force attack trying to guess at weak passwords. Uh, another platform independent risk being the weak passwords themselves. You know, are you relying on an A character password or do you have the, the processes and the, the, the uh, configuration settings that make sure that people have, let's say 20, 25 or more uh, password phrases, for example. From a social engineering perspective, Let's take a look at uh, the, the importance of MFA, that independent of how strong those passwords are, that you, you mitigate further risk in the authentication process if you know, you've got something that, that looks at more than something that you know. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of go over to these cards here on the right side, the stolen keys and unencrypted files. Uh, so first, on an unencrypted files perspective, there is an increased attention, certainly in the encryption space. It applies to the data in flight, as well as the data at rest. Uh, if you look at anything with regard to data set encryption, you're talking about, well, kind of making things stronger than let's say at a volume level, a uh, tape level, and, and saying at the individual data set and file level with minimal application updates, they, this, this gives you uh, additional mitigation uh, for different types of, of attack vectors and risk. Uh, stolen keys then, if you're going to be doing all this encrypting of the data at rest, well, then you have to have really good key management in place. So that's just kind of a whole plethora of, of examples of, of different types of things. And they go into different categories. They, you know, they, we've talked to just in this short amount of time about authentication and uh, access controls and the, the associated encryption policies in place. But uh, the, the one risk card that uh, I'm just about to talk to here is critical code bugs. You know, what is this whole attack factor associated with a potential vulnerability in your code base? So what you need to look at on any platform is to, to pinpoint the, the amount of code, the subset of code on your stack that runs at a very high level of privilege. Because if, if that highly privileged code has an integrity issue, well then that, that presents risk that a threat actor would find it, potentially exploit it and compromise uh, the, other, the other security functions. So they're all interrelated in that you, you look at your enterprise and say, where are my strong points? Where are my relative weak points? And where do I want to invest my time to mitigate next? So, and, and kind of in summary, there's always some level of risk. You're never going to eliminate all risk. Uh, and one thing that uh, has been driven home to me and moved from, uh, from coding in the security space and, and working in the security engineering space to product management, all these are risk-based business decisions. You're making a business decision on whether you're going to mitigate uh, this risk or the other one, to what extent you're gonna mitigate this one over the other one. And so you are making an informed decision when you help to identify what the risks are so, so you can make a, a good informed choice. Right. So onto this uh, next part, we have a bit of a, a, a whimsical security framework here. And uh, I will confess that um, you know, one would say, this is, this is kind of interesting. We've got the, these four categories that talk about eight aspects of your security posture. We spell out this uh, acronym of MUSE, 
Uh, but here, there's actually some serious stuff here in terms of what is your security posture with regard to managing access and logging? What is your security posture with regard to user authentication and analytics? What is your security posture with regard to system integrity, uh, our main topic today, as well as availability? And, and, and sometimes you will get into this uh, side discussion of, well, maybe that's just resilience. So does resilience really count as security? Well, well yes, it is. Right? Denial of service is an attack vector. So availability and resilience definitely plays a part into your overall security posture. And last but not least, you know, and, and a great uh, differentiator for IBM Z as a platform, encryption and data privacy. Um, so if, if you look at some of the origins of this, I don't know if any of you uh, were, uh, were involved or, or participate in our uh, Secure Z escape room uh, experience that we had a couple of years back. And we talked about a threat actor, uh, an insider threat actually. And in that scenario, we went, went over uh, various types of, of things to look out for for secure configuration. And we use the MUSE acronym to talk about a fictitious company, uh, Mockup Services Enterprises. So when we started designing the card game and wanted to have the game mechanics of the card game reflect good security hygiene and a balanced security posture, we figured out a way to use the same acronym. And so it actually is, is a very good high level view for someone who is new to Z as you're trying to translate this to Z related security functions of of how to look at that in a balanced, uh, balanced way. I'm just kind of like confessing here that we designed the card game before we realized it's a valid security framework on its own. That's just kind of how my brain works, I guess. So anyway, on to the rest. Wanted to let everybody know before we go into the nitty gritty of the authorized code scanner, we're going into some background on, on context here. But uh, we start up this grassroots campaign from the development community. And we, we call it the Enterprise Knights of IBM Z. You can find this information out at the IBM Z and Linux One community user group. Uh, we got this one card because we are including the user group inside of the card game itself. And the, the short link is here. But uh, basically, you can either go to the community overall, or you can look at this ibm.biz ek-ibm.z short link uh, to get to the user group itself. So what do we put there? Uh, this is this is very grassroots development effort with regard to blog entries and video content, uh, lightning talk information, uh, stuff on our custom card game. Uh, lots, lots of, of creative things there. Not your uh, traditional type of presentation by any means. And, and what we're doing here, you'll see for the most part, this is about secure configuration. Uh, these are insights that came from places like our ZOS security support team on some of the frequently asked questions that are coming in to their queues. It comes from our own developers in the security space to say, you know, we wanna make sure that clients know about this or that. Uh, and then um, you know, sometimes we get insights from lab services when they do you know, some of their engagements to say, well, here are some configuration uh, snafus that we've run into in the past. So let's communicate those. So if people take a look at them, you know, they, you know this is, you, you can go, read through the security content and, and just roll your own mitigation uh, to, to that. So this is just kind of for your increased awareness of, of what uh, is happening here. And, and so we've had this for a little bit of, of time now, and we start off this new video series that we call Thwarted by IBM Z. So we took the same threat actor from the escape room, and then we converted this into the video series that talks about these platform independent risks and then figures out what is the mitigation for that risk. So here's our series so far. And, and so for those of you that really just wanna talk about the authorized code scanner and integrity, I'm gonna get there very soon, uh, but I just wanted to give context and, and also for any kind of uh, security mindset to, to talk about these other related things as well. So we started off with a, a trailer our new associate product manager in Zero Security uh, did a great job in this in this intro as we talked about uh, the the Muse framework and and how this crazy custom card game is just a vehicle to to talk at a high level of of your security posture and the mitigations possible on ZOS. So then we go and we hear from 
Christopher De Robertis, who's our CPO for Zero Security, as the security hygienist. And he talks about topics like the, the importance of uh, MFA in some form, the, the importance of security hygiene and the tenants and principles of lease access privilege and, and how these feed into NIST guidelines uh, with regard to zero trust and, and, and all kinds of things like this. It's kind of like this um, beginning to more specific topics. So as we get into episode one, this actually uh, pertains to our topic today. It really makes sense uh, in many aspects to start with a review on the Z architecture and the nature of the APF. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a slide coming up. So we go through the fundamentals of, of what that's like on ZOS and Z in general. And then we go into, well, before we even talk about how you make sure you've got this least access privilege philosophy going in your security database, let's make sure you've locked down the database itself because that's kind of like the, 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 the next thing. If you've got your authorized code base locked down, then you also want the security database itself locked down. And then we go into uh, episode three, we hear from uh, Ross Cooper on being authentic about different types of authorization. And then we segue right into the importance of MFA in the episode of multiple factors. Um, in episode five, we hear on the security portal. And then on episode six, uh, then we get into this, in this search for bugs, the integrity entomology topic. And that is the, is the focus of Zach's today. This is the ZOS authorized code scanner topic. But we're not, we didn't stop there. Um, these, these are the episodes we have so far. It, it took us a, a couple months to get there, as you might imagine, to, to, to create these grassroots videos and get these uh, different blogs uh, that were written on like as a side project from all these security SMEs. But we go about locking the keys on how you're going to initially set up your ICSF component and then go into these topics of pervasive encryption, uh, encryption at rest and how you prepare for data set encryption, uh, hearing from the architect herself. Right, Ceci Granza Lewis. From uh, Key Web UI, we hear from Isha Powers on uh, things uh, about EKMF Web and how do you go about planning for operational key management in order to achieve data set encryption at scale. And then we also have an episode, this is our latest one, from Chris Meyer, right? SDSM uh, Network Security uh, Architect on good networking practices because you know, you absolutely have to make sure that you've got you know, strong encryption protocols, processes around you know, the, the network traffic coming in and out of, of the Z box. And that's what we've got so far. We've got a lot of different topics coming. Um, probably if, you know, just a, a handful more before we'll have like a season finale. And uh, if, if people like the content, uh, if they uh, find, it, find it interesting, then uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be renewed for a second season sometime next year. Uh, but take a look. The, the, video, the videos you'll see are, are quite wacky, uh, but the, the blog entries actually have some very solid uh, technical insights from, from the security means. So back to our context. So we're talking about all these different types of mitigation, different categories of security with our news acronym. And what's this got to do with integrity on ZOS? So I'll take three of these examples. And, and this is a, another suit of our custom card game, the project cards, which is here we're going to talk about a, a, a ZOS specific uh, functionality that matches up. It's a matching game, basically, uh, to, to mitigate uh, some platform independent risk. And so for unencrypted files, we have uh, data set encryption. For the, you know, the risk, some of the risks of user ID enumeration, it's how you lock down your security database. And for the, the, uh, the, the risk of social engineering, we talk about multi-factor authentication. And so why do I bring this up again before we talk about integrity? Well, because you, you might have the mindset of saying, well, look at all the time and effort that we put in to locking down our database and making sure our profiles are like pristine, like least access privilege across the board. We have the strongest possible authentication. We have the strongest possible end-to-end -end encryption across our enterprise. Maybe we don't need to worry about integrity. Maybe this is enough. But, and that's, that is your 
risk-based decision to make. This is just to inform everyone that system integrity is the foundation of everything else. And, and so when you talk about the Z architecture, what it means to be authorized with the Z architecture, you're talking about the most highly privileged running code on ZOS. And, and so if there is some kind of integrity flaw that might be there, that might be uh, discovered and potentially exploited, well, you wouldn't want your security database to be undermined by one of these things. And, and, and so people might, might ask, well, where does this authorized code come from, right? If I'm gonna go investigate this and, and I'm going to pay closer attention to the APF, then, then, then who, who owns this? Well, there's certainly a lot of authorized code that comes from IBM. Uh, there's a lot of authorized code that comes from the supporting ZOS ecosystem overall. So this is, this is a group effort. This is how you build the ZOS stack. Uh, and also there could be in-house code that is specific to your enterprise. And you may think, well, I had that custom code running for years and years and years, and it's been dependable. And there's been no, uh, there, there's no, been, no issues of programs blowing up, no issues with scalability. So what would I be worrying about that? Well, no, this is an integrity type of perspective. In the same way that, you know, attacks can become more complex over time, uh, such that we keep increasing the strength of encryption ciphers and protocols, the, the attacks, the, the, the potential uh, attack vectors on, on integrity are similarly something that you want to look at. All right, so onto this. So we, um, and they do humor me very well, I will say, in terms of uh, these, these subject matter experts in, in security as, uh, and, and from uh, my, uh, <laughs> corporate license to Adobe Illustrator and my creative license in making cartoon caricatures of all of these experts. Uh, really quite fun. I, I really must thank them for being really good sports. And so uh, in episode one, Catherine Voss, uh, one of the rising stars uh, at the security engineering team, uh, gives a wonderful blog post on this nature of the APF and, and how critical it is to really lock that down, to understand what are the load lives that are there uh, the significance of uh, linking them uh, AC1, uh, the different states of authorization, where if you have one state, uh, you can then move into other states. So what we're talking about here in the APF, oh, and also, uh, I shouldn't forget, um, also the, the, the commands, the system commands that make it possible to potentially dynamically change the state of the APF and the associated SAF RECF profiles that control the ability to do that. So you want to you want to protect access to the load lives, but you also want to protect the the system commands that make you change, that let, let you change what load lives constitute uh, an APF load dive. So very good fundamental post to start the discussion. And and so what we're really talking about is some piece of code on ZOS that could be running supervisor state key zero. And so what does that mean? Well, if, if you're running in supervisor state, you can, you can invoke any system service. And if you're running with key zero, then you basically can access almost any memory in the whole virtual storage map. And so when you have the ability in key zero to, to look at, to fetch, if not update, uh, system control blocks, well, then that is risk. That is where the risk is at. Uh, so you, you want to make sure that you limit who has the ability to add to these load lives, who can change these load lives. And then this, this falls on to our next slide, our next topic. Uh, so this next one, uh, many of you probably already know uh, Peter Spera. Uh, he is a, a SDSM uh, architect of of the security engineering team uh, basically uh, began and continues to run so many operations associated with the security portal and, and other important aspects of the security engineering activities. And, and so what is the significance here? Right here in, in this video intro, we talk about the importance of secure service. Uh, we talk about uh, some, uh, some Python script downloadables and, 
in his blog entry of how to make sure that you can get this information in the most secure fashion. Um, but uh, it really comes down to this. We strongly encourage any Z client to register to the security portal. And when IBM, for example, finds uh, any kind of uh, potential vulnerability of, of integrity nature on, on say ZOS, we're going to fix that promptly as part of our, 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 our commitment to integrity that, that goes back for decades. And we're going to put that patch out as a second style PTF. It's only going to be visible to those that are registered to the portal. It's not your standard PTF patch. And port the portal is going to send out a secure message to the registrants to let them know that the PTF is available. And they will also provide CVSS vector scoring information that says, well, here's in, in first.org's uh, kind of uh, classification of, of risk and you know, the, the strength of this particular uh, vulnerability uh, from a score of zero to 10, here's, here's how severe it is. And so the portal gives you that number as well as the vector. And the vector tells you what kind of, of vulnerability this is. Uh, it goes into these, the, the three fundamental tenets of security in terms of what is the impact to confidentiality? What is, the, is there impact to uh, integrity? And is there impact to availability? Uh, and lots of other details which you can read more about. So, so what is this? What is the context of this particular topic to the authorized code scanner? Well, it's saying uh, IBM Z has had this long-standing commitment to integrity on the platform. And so we strongly encourage everyone to register for this, make sure that a secure service process is part of your overall security posture. And so when we find uh, these potential vulnerabilities in, in IBM code, this is the vehicle in which we send out the patches. But this is where we go back to the fact that we're not the only ones uh, that, that make authorized code. Right. Chances are that you've, you've got some, some code running on your ZOS stack. It's in your APF that either uh, you wrote in a custom application wise, or you, you got from uh, another ZOS vendor. And so that is the, the relevance of talking about Zax. Uh, so we're about the half hour mark, and I finally arrived at my topic. So hopefully, this is not too uh, verbose in terms of the introduction, but. Uh, I want to take some time to talk, talk about context. So, so this is where it's at. If you're looking at your uh, increasing your security posture and you want to look at relative risk and you want to understand the context of, of system integrity and looking at some form of integrity scanner that is specific to the, the APF, then, then, then here we are. All right, so here is uh, Diane Stamboni, who's a product owner, lead developer on the Zax team. And, and so we have this video that, that, that talks about uh, the, the context here, and she has a blog post that gives an introduction to the authorized code scanner, which hopefully I shall do justice uh, today. So here we go on to the next slide, and we, we clarify this risk. Now over here on the right side of the deck, we have, um, we'll, we'll call it a diagram of perhaps a, a typical parameter list for a program call or supervisor call routine. It's a little convoluted, um, but we'll, I'll back up a step. Why do we talk about program calls and supervisor calls uh, in the context of the APF? Well, because these routines provide this critical boundary between authorized code and unauthorized callers making services of that authorized code. So you've got a program in the APF, in order to create a service routine, in order to create a PC or SVC, you have to be authorized. You have to be authorized to make one. And then these, these calls, these service calls will typically run also at the highest level of privilege. So you can think of a PC or SVC routine as something that is an extension of the APF. It can be very likely that they are running supervisor state key zero. So what makes this significant to integrity and potential attack vectors? Because they accept parameter lists from callers that are not trusted, callers that are typically running unauthorized key eight. And so the parameters coming in have to be very carefully 
copied and, and viewed uh, so that there is no compromise to integrity on the stack. So let me tell you what I mean. You've got, uh, by convention, general register one has the address to the, the first set of parameters. Hardly ever do you see one big continuous parameter list block. Uh, very frequently, you'll see maybe a continuous set of pointers, and then those addresses point to other blocks. Sometimes those blocks point to other blocks. Well, you can't just do a, a move character instruction and just copy this over in a PC or SPC routine that is running key zero. <laughs> because then what you're doing is you're inadvertently allowing this unauthorized caller to, at a minimum, fetch uh, information that they should not be able to fetch. Or, or if it's an output area, uh, the worse yet, you might be giving them the opportunity for to you to update system control blocks on, on their behalf. So, so that's where we get back into the CBSS scoring and the types of things that we, we need to watch out for here in terms of potential like, inadvertent programmer error on PC and SPCs. So a CBSS 6.5 is the probable score for a fetch-related vulnerability or a medium-sized score on the scale of 0 to 10. Or worse yet, if you've got something that is a bug with regard to uh, the output area, um, a store-related vulnerability, that would be high, 8.8 .8 out of 10. So it's um, how do you get to that score? Well, you still need to have a user ID on the system. But, but the significance here, I think, is it doesn't need to be any kind of highly privileged user. This could be anybody who has a user ID on the system who can run a batch job and, you know, and just have a program written you know, in some load library because they're invoking a PC or SVC routine running a high level of privilege. But if that routine has an integrity bug in it that allows them uh, to you know, potentially make an exploit, that is where your risk is at. Right. So hopefully that, that uh, does that general topic uh, some, some justice. But, but this is what we're talking about. Each one of these uh, continuous blocks of parameters constitute risk. If you do not make a safe copy, or if you do not make a safe update of any of these blocks, then you could be inducing uh, an integrity exposure. All right. So you don't have to necessarily know the nitty gritty of what this means. Uh, but we'll, we'll put up an example for reference purposes, because uh, you may look at these two lines of assembler code, and, and if you're an assembler fan, you may say, well, this looks fairly innocent enough. We're doing a, a load address for your output area, uh, putting it into register three, and then we're doing a move character instruction to update that output area. Well, this is very bad, <laughs> because if that output area uh, address happens to be a major control block, and the SPC or PC routine is running key zero, then someone who comes in as an unauthorized caller, you just gave them carte blanche uh, and the ability to, to change uh, these things uh, inside of a system control block. That's why that is bad. Uh, so what's the good, right? What would be the fix to this? If you were the vendor who is going to, you know, have, the, have a scanner find some kind of potential vulnerability and they come back to you with instructions saying, well, we found it at this particular instruction, um, now you got to go patch this so it wouldn't show up in the scan anymore. This is what the developer is going to have to uh, do or something comparable, which is you have to do uh, an ESTAR or something like this to extract uh, from the stack, you know, what is the caller's key, right? So then the, the PC routine is going to say, well, I can't safely use my key. I'm running key zero. I have to make sure if I'm going to update their output area of a, of a parameter uh, address that I have not or cannot verify, then I have to make sure that I, out, I update that output area in the key of the caller. So basically, these, these set of instructions, they're extracting that the caller is running key eight. And then they're getting set up for that output data area address. And then instead of a move character, using especially architected instructions, been around on the Z architecture for ages, move with destination key. So now, using key eight on this special instruction, if they're not authorized to the parameter list that they gave you, then you blow up. And in the realm of system integrity, blowing up is a good thing. You're maintaining integrity. Uh, so, so that's kind of the nitty gritty 
details of what happens on the on the application side. Uh, this is something that, that a, a vendor would need to do, or if you've got custom code, then then you would need to look at. But um, but backing up just a step, this is why uh, we we have this demand for the authorized code scanner. Uh, a couple of years back, we actually did a little workshop with some clients and said, this is what integrity means with respect to the APF and the service routines. This is the type of code uh, that, that you need to look at. And uh, maybe they went, uh, our clients came back to us and said, yeah, but I don't have access to that source code. And, and even for the, the situations that I do, I don't necessarily you know, have the, the means to go and, and, and examine uh, all the assembler code that, that I might have. I need to have some assistance uh, some some kind of tool that's going to scan for this kind of thing. So that's why we created it. Uh, so the scanner is to search for potential potential vulnerabilities. It is a dev test dynamic scanner. Now, what do I mean by that? Right. So we we know that the way that this scanner is going to work, it, you need to have your PCs and SVCs live, but this is not for your production system. You say, well, why is that? Remember, if if, if integrity is good then uh, this kind of test is gonna blow up. This is a very volatile tool in terms of the system that it runs on. It is going to cause all kinds of events uh, because by and large, there's, it's gonna go and, and find all these cases where integrity is maintained, which means it's gonna blow up a lot. <laughs> so if you're gonna have events, uh, potential dumps for diagnostics, you, you do not wanna be running this on production uh, to the point that we actually changed the licensing agreement on uh, ZOS uh, uh, V2R4 to say, <laughs> if you're running Zax, it needs to be on dev test. <laughs> um, but that, that's the nature of, of what the tool does. So back to our card game, Here, here's our Zax equation. And again, we'll say, you can never completely eliminate risk, but you can mitigate risk with security function that addresses a particular attack vector, a, a particular platform independent risk. So that original card that we, sh we showed a couple uh, slides back, critical code bugs, as they apply to ZOS, we're talking about the APF and this extensions is we have this tool now, a, a dev test dynamic scanner that will look for these things to mitigate the risk of an integrity uh, exposure on some of the most highly privileged code that you've got running uh, on your enterprise. Uh, so, so that's the equation. And now we'll go into some of the nitty gritty of the uh, externals here. Um, the authorized code scanner consists of some RECs, uh, some batch processing, as, a, as well as a start task. Where does its input come from? Well, it needs PC and SVC tables. It generates them on your behalf, depending on the nature of your, of your live system right there. Uh, and good to keep in mind that the PC numbers actually can change uh, with every IPL. So it has to be a dynamic generation of these tables. Uh, Syslog is the primary feed right now. And, and the recommended output is a very well secured data set. Uh, as you might imagine, this is a fairly sensitive tool. I mean, it is, it is looking for potential vulnerabilities in ZOS of, a, of the flavor of, of 6.5 or 8.8 .8 out of 10 in the CVSS scoring system. So you wanna make sure that you have got everything locked down for this. You wanna lock down uh, who can run the code, how you've locked down the, the tool itself, that you are making sure that you are completely secured all the input and you have secured all the output with the absolute uh, minimum level of access. Um, so, so there's that. So in running the tool, what do you gotta do? Well, you're gonna initialize the start task like you would any other start task. Uh, you're gonna run these batch jobs we provide to generate these tables. And, and then you run some recs that we provide to generate the test cases uh, to be to executing in batch. So they can go directly or we've got a set of ISPF panels. Um, we've got some filtering options for inclusion and exclusion lists. Uh, we, we got some of that uh, feedback early on uh, from clients uh, where, you know, like any scanner, you have the possibility of, of false positives or, or even if you have found something and you're looking for some remediation uh, from somewhere else, some other party, then you, you wanna be able to uh, temporarily exclude certain things um, or if you're trying to do a partial run to reproduce a certain thing, then you might just have a, an inclusion list that says, well, I don't want to run across all PCs and SVCs on, on the stack. I mean, you could have dozens upon dozens. You could have hundreds. In some instances, you might have 
thousands on, on a particular image. So you might not necessarily want to run the scanner against all of them all the time. So we give them some options there. And then you wait for the completion of the set and you take a look at the results. All right, so, so here is some sample discovery output. Uh, and the, the highlights, we've got your module name and offset information, uh, the admin code and reason that came out, uh, the, uh, the PSW, we offer the assembler translation of that machine code, as well as the target address that was involved when the hit took place. Um, possible CVS score. Oh, and I should clarify, since I mentioned admin and code and reason, there are cases where it blows up and you still have a problem. <laughs> uh, so, so, it's, so we give clarity there in terms of what the possible CVSS score could be in this particular test case instance. Uh, there's a slip sample. In, in case the summary of diagnostics here is insufficient, then you may need to run the tool again with this slip so that you get a dump uh, taken so you have more diagnostics available. Um, and I'll say, again, uh, there can be some false positives and you know, we're not guaranteed to be able to repeat the results each time because it is somewhat dependent on the random contents of memory at the time of the run. Uh, that being said, it is, um, it is highly repeatable and it is highly reliable. So here you got general regs before and after, uh, access regs in the case of cross memory as it, as it applies. Um, so, so that's a lot of, of nuts and bolts gobbledygook. If, if you are the one running the tool, you're not necessarily the one that's going to be fixing this. Certainly not if you don't own the cone yourself. So what is the most important piece of information about these highlights is probably the load module uh, of the detected load module name of where this hit was found. Because with the load module name, you've got a three character prefix. From that three character prefix, you know what application it was. You know what application it was, then you know who owns it. You know that if it's you, if it's IBM, if it's the vendor community, whatever it would be. This is about figuring out, okay, this is where uh, the, the, the hit was uh, made uh, from the tool. And then here gives you some information of, well, who now has to go investigate this to see if this is a real vulnerability or not, and, and how to plan remediation accordingly if, if that is needed. So there's that. Um, this sample summary here, this is what you would like to see, we always want to see, uh, which is the, the summary for any given PC. We have uh, you know, 20 hexadecimal templates run that generated 45 hexadecimal uh, test iterations. We found no evidence of overlays, and no uh, evidence of potential vulnerabilities on this scan. Uh, so, yeah. So we will have this kind of summary for uh, for all the PCs and SVCs that are that are part of the scan. Here's a screenshot of our ISPF support with the uh, different configuration options and different filters and inputs and outputs that you're going to specify. Um, I want to let everybody know there is a DA FAR out there. Uh, OA five nine seven zero three is not closed just yet. Uh, but uh, it will be coming soon. And this is based on some client feedback. Uh, we have a new summary output option coming. One thing that we, uh, we, we did run into is that, well, if there is a potential hit on a given module, a given offset, since we generate so many different test cases to, to run at this context-free so many different ways, we, would, uh, we could hit the same uh, module and offset multiple times. So it could make the output rather lengthy. So we put in new summary so that uh, we, we minimize the duplication of those hits. Uh, we've also done some enhancements on load module identification, depending on how the PCs or SVCs are defined by whoever creates them. Uh, they're, they're, you're not necessarily guaranteed to have that load module name, which is rather important. So, so we have some things like uh, even uh, scanning through some storage for you know, eye catchers on module names and, and creative things like that. Uh, so that's coming as well as some added customization for your test case to HCL, so you can do other things uh, with, with the tests if you should so choose to do so. Uh, so that is coming. Uh, so pausing up here, we're talking about the, uh, the um, enablement. So, so this is a feature on ZOS. And so there is an update to IFA PRVXX involved. And it's just an example syntactically of what that would be. Um, if you have any further questions uh, at all, you can ask them like right now through the chat uh, or live, however you'd like. Um, but if you want to you know, have a discussion, you want to contact me uh, after the conference, uh, this is fine too. You can just email me directly. Um, and, and regardless, uh, and again, 
and right from the beginning of the conversation, and I'll, 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 I'll circle back again, the use cases for cybersecurity are called risks. So I encourage you to look at platform independent risks and to assess from a business perspective, which uh, you want to invest uh, your focus on and decide where, where are you going to increase that security posture. And so that's absolutely why we created the Thwarted by IBM Z video series and, and blog entries to give you more insights from a, a ZOS perspective of, of things to consider and actions that you can take. Uh, so this is just one aspect of, of many. You'll see the, the majority of the material out there uh, is, is not price products at all. There are some, but this is, this is really about helping to build up your security posture. But if you are wondering, you know, what is the significance of the APF, highly privileged code, and, and uh, the importance of having uh, some form of integrity scanning on ZOS, then, uh, then hopefully this helped out today. And uh, that's what I've got. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you, James, to let me know, do we have any kind of questions out there in, in the chat or anybody who wants to go off mute to talk about stuff? Thank you so much for that, Brian. So yeah, any questions, anybody? Let me just unmute, uh, allow people to unmute themselves. So yeah, go ahead, post questions in the chat or um, feel free to unmute your line and, and, and fire away questions. Hi, Jamie, it's Lenny here. Hi, Lenny. Hi. Hi, Brian. Thanks for that, uh, that uh, presentation, very useful. Um, I'm interested in understanding whether uh, the code scanner scans uh, APF libraries or whether it only can, scans uh, PCs and SVCs? Oh, it's a very good question, right? So this is, it is, uh, it is scoped currently to PCs and SVCs and it is uh, dynamic in nature. So it is not doing any kind of uh, static uh, kind of scanning. Uh, so short answer is no, um, and just given that context, right? PCs and SVCs can, can, can be considered an extension of the APF because of their high level of privilege. Um, but uh, it is something that has to be run dynamically and it doesn't, it doesn't test the, the APF load modules themselves. Okay, can I uh, come in with a couple of follow-ups? Um, Absolutely. So most, um, most customers I've worked with have a wealth of authorized code, which is not from IBM. It comes from various manufacturers, which we're all aware, CA, BMC, and, and multiple other ones, as well as their own exits, their own um, locally developed code as well. And our concern really is that these these programs as well need to be uh, need to be checked. We know this uh, in a sense. There are three sources of uh, authorized code. There is a, you move from uh, from key eight um, problem state into uh, a higher state using PC, using SVC, or by invoking an AC one program from a, an APF authorized library. And it's that third one, which, which really has the wealth of uses, has enormous number of uses. Uh, and we saw in our presentation yesterday of a young man who did some fuzzing on various programs in authorized libraries um, based on a, an ADTD system, I think, supplied by IBM, and had found numerous, um, shall we say, integrity exposures. So the need for authorized, sorry, for scanning authorized code seems to me to apply a great deal to these other authorized libraries, as well as SVCs and PCs. And I'm sorry, it's a long question, but can you respond? No, that's, that, that's a really, it's a really good question. And I think there are several caveats to it. Um, you know, certainly can uh, recognize the insight and certainly would encourage, let's say, uh, a request for enhancement uh, on this scanner or something comparable uh, that would start to extend the aperture or the scope of, of scanning. Uh, so that's, that's a, a valid uh, technical request. So thank you for that. Uh, and then the other aspect being the scrutiny of uh, the APF in general, because as you mentioned, you, you have uh, authorized code 
that's coming from IBM, from the vendor community, all these different types of, of areas. And, and I know, for example, in the, uh, there's look into options for, let's say, uh, a file integrity monitoring that are out there that says, let me help scan the delta or, or to, to track the deltas in the APF over time. So I, I think those are, they're different, they're distinct, but they're, they're related where you wanna say, all right, I wanna scan more of, of different ways in which authorized code can be invoked. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a really good request. And then uh, the other being my APF in general, because it is so powerful, and, and I want to make sure that I am uh, monitoring that carefully in terms of uh, deltas uh, when, when things may have changed, then and that's something uh, worth considering as well. Does, does that help? It helps. Um, it, it still concerns me that uh, we have, um, well, probably quite a few integrity exposures in, uh, in programs that uh, are being supplied and we're they seem to be open to be found. The young man who worked on this, uh, who present, presented yesterday, had found these in remarkably short space of time using the same fuzzing techniques which are used against uh, Linux open source systems. Uh, and perhaps, uh, yeah, there needs to be uh, some work in that area. And I wasn't sure, I've never have been sure whether the authorized code scanner was uh, only dealing with SVCs and PCs. Uh, a relatively small number of uh, software packages from, um, fr from third parties use extra SVCs and PCs. Uh, and if they do use them, it's usually a relatively small amount of the code. So the large proportion of the code is usually simply in an APF authorized library designed to be invoked either from batch or from some other interface. Oh, and I might add that the, uh, the invocation of authorized code within TSO, of course, is uh, yet another headache um, because it's a slightly different environment that presents its own set of challenges, which are different from those in batch. Gotcha. So, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Yes, um, it, so, and, and reiterate, and, and, and back to an earlier part of the presentation, the, the importance of the security portal and, and IBM's commitment to system integrity. If uh, there's any kind of question whether something is a potential vulnerability to, to IBM products, then absolutely you know, contact uh, the, the portal administration and, and that would be investigated to see if, if that's, you know, truly something that would be patched from, from IBM's perspective and that something would be taken uh, very seriously with, uh, with you know, very, very high priority in terms of the, the general usage of, of APF and how it extends to uh, the vendor community and custom code, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a very valid point uh, for extending the scope of, of scans. So I think those are good things to to observe and as there's further further focus on the integrity space, I think it's, it's really valuable. You know, if we, if we continue to look at how encryption has evolved over time, how protocols get stronger, the ciphers get stronger, uh, a similar fashion where you, you look at uh, potential ways to look for, you know, these, these types of uh, complex attack vectors, then you, you want to do more in the way of mitigation. So uh, I think that's a, a good place to focus on. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there because I think I need to give time to other people to ask questions. Oh, and one other thing that um, I did want to point out too, um, we're certainly you know, not looking to put the vendor community on a notice. We're just looking to uh, increase and, and strengthen the integrity of all client staff. Uh, so what we typically do before we have another round of enhancements uh, to the scanner is that we will invite uh, uh, partner world participants to a, a closed beta and then, you know, I get their feedback and, and give them an early chance to go uh, look at these things. Uh, so one thing that, uh, you know, that, that clients that you can do is encourage uh, vendor community from the applications that, that you know you have. To, to have them uh, participate in the beta uh, because 
then you know they they have an early look at the scanner uh, before uh, anybody else. Uh, thank you, Lenny, for your contribution. There. And we have a comment from Patrick Loftus. He says, "I dread to think what um, what that young man would have found on a system full of non IBM software." <laughs> okay, I take you talking about Jake Patrick. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm just thinking we've all probably seen software from various vendors that I'm not talking about CA and BMC and some of the bigger ones, but sometimes a, we're all sort of forced to put software onto our systems that maybe isn't the normal quality we'd expect. Yeah. Um, there must be all kinds of software on Z that isn't really up to scratch. So I could imagine he would have found all kinds of flaws on a real customer system indeed so so uh if i can butt in yet again jamie and ask brian uh is there any program in ibm to to, to perform those fuzzing techniques on existing programs within zos i can double check uh but but with you, you bring this up today, uh, not to my knowledge, but but I can double check on that. Okay. Any more questions from anybody before we close? No? Okay, Brian, thank you so much for uh, taking us through that session. Some certainly some food for thought there. Um, so for the purpose of um, feedback, uh, this is session 1A0, so if you could please do that. And um, remember, it contributes to your CPE points if you need to claim those. Also, enter into the prize draw um, and also feedback for Brian and, uh, and us for, for, for GSE as well. So be grateful if you can do that. And don't forget our charity um, as well. So, Brian, like I said, thank you so much. I know it takes effort and research and things to put these sessions together. It can take time. So um, thank you for coming to present to us today. I'm sure we'll have you back on our stage at some point in the, in the future. Okay. Thanks very okay. much, Jamie. Really, really happy to present today. Thank you. Okay, so what's coming next? Um, some of you may have been looking at the lunch and learn session for today and seeing it to be confirmed. Um, so we were kind of in GSE panicking, thinking who's filling that slot? So that session is still going ahead. So if you want to join it, um, you'll be listening to yours truly. There's, there's a, a, a filler session being added around home network security. So what you can do at home to, uh, to protect your home network. And that's a session that I ran in June for the GSC security working group. So you are more than welcome to come and join me there and I will be presenting. Um, and for the security stream, we will be back today at 3.30 with um, Y Choi, who will be doing a part two of her um, certificate session that follows on from the conference from last year. So hopefully you can join that as well. But there are of course other sessions running which you're welcome to join. So. Um, We'll see you a bit later today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks once again, Brian. Thank you. See you.